you stand with me this morning? Rise up, O Church of God. Rise up, O Church of God. Have done with lesser things. Give heart and mind and soul and strength to serve the King of Kings. Rise up, O Church of God. His kingdom tarries long. Bring in the day of brotherhood and end the night of wrong. Rise up, O sons of God. The church for Southern Baptists are big believers in the separation of church and state. Have you heard that? You know why Southern Baptists are big believers in the separation of church and state? Because we are a missionary people. Baptists do not believe that the state should have the right or the authority to coerce the religious conviction of anyone, and we believe that everyone ought to be free to proclaim their religious faith in the marketplace. Because we know we proclaim the truth. And if we get the truth out in the marketplace, it will change lives. It is our missionary imperative that has driven our concern with church and state. For we believe that every Baptist is a missionary. And the question that you and I have to face is, have we honestly asked God what mission field He wants us to serve? Have we put our lives before Him? and said, Father, if it's home or far away, if it's a place across the street from McDonald's or a place where they things, I don't even want to know what it is they serve me. Am I going to the place you want me to go? We have this time every year when we invite the International Mission Board to come for the specific purpose of reminding us there's more than one mission field in serving the world. And the challenge for you and for me is to make sure we are available for any mission field God wants us to serve. You are a missionary. As we come before the Lord in prayer, I'm going to ask Dr. Ken Taylor, one of our professors of missions, to lead us in a word of prayer. Before you sit down, turn to somebody next to you and just remind them, missionaries are us. Would you do that? <laughs> missionaries are us. <laughs> hey, thank you for helping me today. Thank you so very much. 
It is a very significant week in the life of New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. Each day in chapel, we'll be having a speaker from our International Mission Board. On Thursday, Dr. Jerry Rankin, the president of our International Mission Board, will be here in chapel. We're going to have a wonderful time as we think about the worldwide task of the Church of Jesus Christ. Never in my lifetime, since I've been living and breathing, has the world been more open to the gospel of Jesus Christ than it is now. There have never been more countries more accessible than are accessible right now. And the key is, when the door is open, will we go through? And I hope and pray that this will be a great time for you. I hope you'll invite your spouse to join you in chapel, even if that spouse is not normally able to. It's a wonderful high time in the life of New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. Our preacher for the day is Randy Sprinkle. Randy was appointed by the International Mission Board in 1975, his first, first place of service with Ethiopia. He served several other places in Africa since then. He is now in charge of their international prayer strategy and mobilizing Southern Baptists to pray for the work of world missions. I want to see if Brother Randy would join me here. Would you come join me up here, Brother Randy? Our <laughs> seminary congregation goes every once in a while. We like to give pop tests to our speakers. So I want to ask you if you could conjugate for us, Luo, uh, and give it to us. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm glad. <clears throat> How in the world did you know with certainty that God wanted you to be a missionary in another land? Could you just share briefly with us? We did not until our hearts were right to follow Christ wherever. And when we did then, and if you listed all the places in the world, my wife and I and she's back there, we would honestly tell you the last place on earth that we would have ever dreamed of serving would have been Africa. But since it's clear that we don't think the way he thinks, and we don't go at things the way he goes at them, the bottom of our list may be the top of his list. And there came as things began to be removed from our lives step by step by step till there was a clear understanding that in terms of being a minister of the good news of Jesus Christ, the place that we were to walk out that kind of faithful calling was on the soil of Africa. And so we gladly went. How in the world did you tell your wife about this? I mean, now, Ethiopia is not high on the Club Med list of delightful, intriguing places to go for what most people know, think about when they think about Ethiopia. Botswana has the biggest lions in Africa. I mean, if you want to see a really big lion, you go to Botswana. How did you think with your family about the danger and the challenge involved in missions? I know several of those lions on a first-name basis, by the way, in Botswana. In our praying, my wife and I had made the commitment before the Lord not for one or the other of us to lead the other or to run ahead, but to follow along hand in hand, two that have become one, in the way that Christ would lead. Now, I confessed to a class earlier this morning that in our prayer back 27 years ago, uh, together we were praying, Lord, we'll go anywhere in the world. Now, individually and privately, I thought we were both praying that way. Only later, when we knew where God was leading us, did my wife, and I suppose it was under conviction, confess that actually she'd been praying, Lord, we will go anywhere in the world as long as there's no snakes there. Which may have cinched Africa for us, I'm not sure. <laughs> but, uh, but he made plain that was it. And the beautiful thing was how I thank him that I didn't have to convince my wife. He was responsible to show us both where he wanted us to follow him, and then together we could make our yes a unified, single yes before him who is our Lord. Just one last question. After you got over there on the field, you served in three different countries over there, were you ever able to have as much a sense of security over there as you were living over here in the United States? Far better. Because here, before he was Lord above all in our lives, uh, we looked to the world for security. But when he became our security, then it really didn't matter where we were or how he led us. If we were indeed following him, that meant he was always out ahead of us. And uh, yeah, we were in the midst of wars and disease and danger and robbers. Um, sounds a little bit like New Orleans, doesn't it? Yes. And um, in some ways... 
real safety is found inside the everlasting arms. And that's where we all walk, missionary, pastor, whatever. Or that's where we're supposed to walk. So, yeah, I don't know about security, but what I know about is peace that's beyond understanding. Thank you so much, Randy. And as a matter of fact, you took my tagline for that time of testimony because if you're wondering why in the world God led you to a place like New Orleans to go to seminary, it's because it's a place that's so different than home. And it's a great place to learn that wherever you are, God is. No matter how it looks to the outsiders, no matter how it looked to you before God called you there, wherever you are is the place God wants you to be. And there's no more exciting, fulfilling, or secure place in all the world. This whole week, if we've not done it before, if we don't do it again, oh, let's ask God, would you speak to me, Lord, and show me where is my mission field? Would you bow your heads with me for a moment? There are people all over the world who don't know the Lord. They haven't had a chance to hear. As we invite the Lord to do His work in our lives this morning, as we worship Him, as we lift Him up together, let's pray for those that haven't yet had the privilege of worshiping. They don't know our precious Lord and Savior. They don't know what He did for them to bring them into the presence of Almighty God. Slip the prayer to the peoples of the world. people, let's pray for ourselves as well, that we would be a shining light to the world. Would you stand with us to sing? May we be a shining light to the
brothers of mine, you did for me. Now I'm letting down my guard, and I'm opening my heart. Help me speak your word to every needful ear. Jesus is waiting, not too far from here. waiting not too far from Master, your presence is indeed near and dear. And you've met us and moved us in these moments. And we bow and acknowledge you. We would hear their cries. Lord Jesus, we would hear the cry of Your heart. And so we invite You to have Your way in us today. We pray through Your matchless name. Amen. I invite you this morning to open your Bibles with me to the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 22. 
We find here preparation for that last Passover. An upstairs room already made ready. And then a gathering of those disciples with Jesus. On my last trip to the Middle East, as I found my seat on that 747 and started that eight or nine hour flight across to to land in Tel Aviv, I was in a two seat section and the man over next to the window uh, looked like he was going home. He looked Middle Eastern. We passed some brief greetings. Uh, Things got quiet and after a while as I prayed for him for a bit, then I tried to extend conversation again to him and this time in, in pretty good English. He began to talk with me and before very long I found of all things that he was a Palestinian man and I thought, well, maybe he had been here in the States on a visit and he was just going back home. I was only half right. He was going back home, but he wasn't here visiting. Of all things, he lived here on a green card and more than just living here, he lived here. He owns a little grocery store somewhere, as he said, in a dangerous neighborhood in New Orleans. And when he could save enough money two or three times a year, he flew back to visit, as he told me, his children, which I thought meant he didn't have a wife or she was deceased. And I said, oh, is your wife no longer here? Oh, no, my wife cares for my children. I'm going home to see my children. I thought it was very strange. He wasn't interested in seeing his wife, but he was very interested in seeing his children. As I continued to pray silently for him and talked with him, I moved the conversation just from him because as I asked him, well, you know, why are you in America? What do you want? And he began to share with me his big dreams of getting rich. So I moved it from one Palestinian to the Palestinian people. And I said, what do you, as a people, the Palestinians, what do you want above all else? And he, he answered instantly. He said, Oh, we want peace. And then before I could even ask a follow-up question, but he said, religion is the problem. I thought that was fascinating as I thought for a few moments. In a bit I said, all right, tell me, what would it take to have lasting peace for the Palestinian people? And this time, he did not have a quick answer. In fact, the silence began to get long and a bit uncomfortable. And as I looked to him, I could see turmoil that was in him coming out in his face. And finally, after a long time of silence, as he mulled over what would it take to have lasting peace, he said, I don't know. I don't know. No, at all. Juxtapose that with a world mission conference last year at a mega church here in our own country where I was speaking. I looked so forward to going there. It was going to be a great, I knew it to be a great church. From the outside, it seemed that way. But when I got there for those days, when I got there up close, on the inside, I began to see that it did look good on the outside. But on the inside, it was just a fast, fancy, religious operation. And how I began to know that it then finally concluded correctly was this. As the days of that World Missions Conference unfolded, I began to understand that that hurry, scurry, busy, frenetic pastor in control of every aspect of everything, I began to clearly understand he was scared to death. And I thought, what is he so scared of? And by the last day, I understood. He was holding a World Missions Conference all right for this glorious big mega church. But he was scared to death that His people might hear God. He was scared to death that they might see God. He was scared to death that they might turn toward God. Which I came to understand would mean He would turn from His grand plan for them and the massive multi-tens of millions of dollars that He had in mind to build a great, great monument. 
And then we find here in Luke 22, one other man. Oh, that pastor, if I would have just walked in off the street and said to him, that pastor at that mega church, what does it take to have lasting peace? Oh, he could have given me the four spiritual laws, I'm sure, the Roman road, how to have a full and meaningful life. He could have spilled them off, rolled them all off. He was, he was the consummate professional. But there was no need for me, had I just walked in off the street, to have asked the question because his life fairly shouted the answer. It was, I don't know. I don't know at all. All I know is this rat race of ministry and ministry goals. And then here in Luke 22 in the upper room, oh, there about verse 13 and 14 and 15, as this supper with the Lord unfolds, we see that here are a very religious group of young men Oh, they know the religious expectations. They know the anticipations that they have in their mind for the places of ministry that they're going to hold with the one they believe to be the Messiah. That's what it looks like on the outside. But on the inside of them and that room, tension, turmoil, self-serving religiosity. And then in verse 33... Peter, while the, while the dispute is going on, the shuffling for position, Peter trumps them all and says, you go to prison, Lord, I'll follow you there. You even go to your death, and I'll follow you there too. And Jesus, in that direct but gentle way, says, no, Peter, you won't. You think that I am the most important thing in your life, but very soon you will see that someone else is most important and that someone is you, Peter. And so whether it is a, a, a big dreams, New Orleans, green card, Palestinian merchant, or a big time, big plans, pastor, or even right here, a big talking apostle, Peter. The fact is that each one of these, for reasons of their own, have not found the way of peace, which is truly and only also the way of promise and of power. And so right here near the end of Jesus' earthly ministry, we find Him Himself here in the upper room, hearkening back to the beginning, right near the beginning of His earthly ministry, to some simple words, those first words, to that first disciple who ironically happens to be Peter along with Andrew, his brother, as he says those words, liberating words, but far more than that, forever life-orienting Words. You remember those words on the seashore? Those first recorded words to the first disciples? They were simple. They were profound. They were simply, Peter, Andrew, you follow me. How clear the Word of God is. We're to be not conformed to this world regardless of how pervasive or how powerful we are to be not conformed to this world. And to that, Jesus simply says, no, instead, just follow Me. You say, but what about the very successful religious ways, the models that are being held up and that are very attractive and that already I've latched onto one? Jesus says, no, follow Me. You say, but Lord, I want to build... I want, just with your grace, of course, I want to build a great church for you somewhere in the suburbs, ideally. But I want to build a great church for you. And Jesus says, just follow me, would you? Would you remember 
some other words that I said in this very same upstairs room. Calvary right ahead. But before, remember, you can do nothing on your own. The first and always most important thing is follow me. And so what he's saying, but Lord, I've heard from, I've, I've heard from famous people. What I need to be doing is dreaming a big dream for you and then go out there and make it happen. And if we'll be still long enough with that idea, what we'll hear is Jesus saying, you may have heard that, but I didn't say that. I said to you, follow me. Your culture says, seek self-fulfillment. But I say to you, no. Seek instead Me. And when you find Me, follow Me. Tonight before all of us go to sleep, 21,000 Chinese will die and go to hell. And in the passing of those 21,000 Chinese lives, forever gone and lost, there will echo the once promising but now heartbreaking words of Jesus, I came that they might have life. And now, death, eternal death, is theirs among hundreds of thousands of Afghans today, this very day, there in the camps of Pakistan and up on the northern border of Tajikistan, Afghans laying out in the freezing temperatures tonight, driven out by a horrible brand of the fundamentalist Islam among the Taliban. The great need in the camps, hundreds of thousands of Afghans today, the great need, they say, is for amputation, equipment, and personnel to stop the killing advance of the gangrene from frozen limbs. And Jesus says, I came that they might have life, not a torturous death in a refugee camp. Just three weeks ago, on the news, you saw as well as I do what, what they're saying is the largest gathering of human beings in the history of the planet. It was in India and a massive festival there known as Kumbh Mela. How they can know, we don't know, but the best estimates seem to be 45 million people moved into that area from all over India, there for miles along the Ganges River in preparation for a propitious moment when they would all, 45 million, wade into the Ganges, supposed holy river, and in this propitious moment, wash away their sins. They waded in with great hope. They came out with a sense of euphoria. But days later, the euphoria was replaced with reality as an earthquake shook the western part of that vast nation and thousands and then tens of thousands died and went to hell. And on the news, we look now into the hollow eyes of Gujarati people in western India and we hear floating over the sadness and the stench, I came that they might have life. And today, somewhere in a filthy, fetid little cell in Africa, Muslim fanatics are torturing a man our brother. For centuries, his people group has been locked in darkness, 
never knowing there was a way of light and life. But God's heart for His tribe was not faint or failing. And He called. Some men and women responded and went to an impossible place to take the Gospel to what seemed to be an impossible people lost for all their history. And then a year or so ago, in answer to unceasing prayer and struggle in the language and sharing of the precious seeds of the Gospel, the first man in the history of that tribe passed from death unto life. What glory, what joy in the heavenlies. And more than that, how God had gifted that very first known believer from that tribe. How He used him and how the translation of the New Testament began to just surge forward with him to the point that by the end of this past year, it was completed. It's not printed yet, but the translation is done. And they were ready in this new year to move into the Old Testament and begin to work while He with others prayed that that first fruit might spread in a great multiplying until last week when the security police arrived and hauled Him away to an unknown location. And while we gather as best we know he, he cries and suffers alone under the torture. And we pray, Oh, Lord Jesus, as You prayed for Peter to this faith might not fail, we pray for this unnamed precious brother that his faith too may not fail. And those very saulish, persecuting guards might see in Him something that is irresistible. The very presence of the Most High, the Savior of the world. They tell us today that there are 245 recognized nations in the world. Would you guess with me, of the 245 countries in the world, which one is number one in terms of availability of access to the good news? Go ahead, take a guess. We're living in it. We're sitting in it. 245 nations in all the world. Number one in terms of greatest accessibility and availability of the Gospel is our very nation right here. I lost count over at Providence House when I was looking for CNN headline news. I lost count of how many channels had somebody proclaiming the Gospel on them. Just here in one city. This world with 245 nations and literally tens of thousands of people groups this world is the very same world that Jesus said, go into all of this world and proclaim the good news to all. Now, when He said that, He didn't pick that, that generic, basic, simple, baseline word in the Greek for all. He picked the strong form of that word so that what Jesus was saying was when He said, go into all the world, what He was really saying is go into absolutely all the world and proclaim, speak out the glorious good news. Among the East African tribal people, the Samburu, even before the Gospel ever went to them, they had a glorious grasp of the truth. And they expressed it in a little saying that became part of their oral tradition. And they said it often and spread it wide through the Samburu people, even before the Gospel came. And here's what it was. The Samburu came to understand that to have good news and not share it is a sin. I've just come in from Southern Africa. While I was there, 
I was at three different AIDS funerals. Africa, as your president mentioned, has been our home. It's more difficult to accept the fact that Africa is now dying before our very eyes. A proud, strong land of survivors is visibly weakening before our very eyes and sinking down to their knees and then over on their sides as life slowly slips out and away. I went with one of my colleagues to an AIDS cemetery, just the two of us alone, in preparation to take a great host of on-site prayers, almost 90 of them later that week. The grave diggers now no longer have peace work where you get a little job here and a little job there. Grave digging in Africa is a full-time profession now. To the point that at two of the funerals, while the funerals were conducted, which they're done at the graveside, between them, the grave diggers kept digging. At one of those funerals, I noticed none of these were Christian funerals. I don't speak Shona. Uh, this was in Zimbabwe and we served in other countries. And so I, I asked an African pastor friend who was with me, I said, I keep, I keep hearing this haunting song that this, this funeral is singing over here. These are all non-Christian funerals. And so I said, would you just listen and tell me what they're singing? And so he just stopped and listened for just a little bit. And then you could tell that as he took it in and as it took root in him, it was moving him. And he turned to me and he said, oh, do you know what they're singing? I said, no, tell me. He said, they're singing now that he's gone. Let us pray. It's too late to pray. Now that there's still yet day, let's pray and obey and take the good news. My father in 1991, sitting in the family room of our home with my mother, fell over into the floor with a heart attack and in a matter of moments died. She was there. She was instantly on the phone to the paramedics. But there was nothing that anyone could do or could have done. He was dying and he died. Africa is dying just assuredly as my father was. But in this case, there's some time. There's a couple, three years or four there's time to go to a dying man and take the good news. In fact, we took intercessors back out there, the poorest section of that big city of Harare, Zimbabwe. We put teams of intercessors all in through there as they prayer walked their way through and spoke to children and blessed the people and shared the gospel. And the dear pastor, that very man who was standing with me at that age funeral, sent me an email the week after that when I got back here before I came down here to New Orleans to say that after we were there with all those intercessors, he said, the talk, the talk of that township, the poorest place in the whole area of Horizon Zimbabwe, the talk the whole week was they could not believe that white Christians loved them enough to come there and pray for them and sit with them and hold their children and cry with them. And he said that's all they talked about all week. He said on Sunday morning at the little mission church that he pastors along with two others, he said there were a lot of people he'd never seen before. The majority of the adults in that poverty-ridden area had AIDS. He said there were a lot of adults he'd never seen before. He preached the glorious the good news. And when he gave an invitation, seven men and women stepped out and receive Jesus as their Savior. Another one of those funerals was a young woman, a young mother, don't know her age, but in her 20s, leaving five little AIDS orphans. 
There was no husband at the funeral. I can't know, but probably each of those little children had a different father. Desperate poverty. Selling herself to stay alive. Committing suicide by her activities. But let's remember, sure, that's sin. But let's remember, all sin is suicide. And over those haunting AIDS funerals comes Jesus' words again, wafting in the African breeze, I came that they might have life. And so the problem today is not that we need more missionaries. The problem in the American church today is we need more followers of Christ. Later in the same chapter, Luke 22, the courtyard fire is kindled. Jesus is in custody and already suffering. And Peter slips in out of the, the shadows of the darkness on the fringe up along the fire. And you know what happens. Time after time after time, he is confronted. And Luke records the first time that he says, I, I, don't, I don't know him. The second time, his response is, Oh no, I'm not one of them. And the third time, in essence, no. I'm not with this man. I don't walk with him. And then, the heart-breaking, life-shaking instant, as Luke records in verse 61, And then the Lord turned and looked at Peter. For every single one of us, there comes that moment, that day when our eyes will lock in connection with Jesus. Notice Jesus had to turn and look. And the reason is up earlier, Peter records, or or Luke records for us, It was because Peter was following his master at a distance. He had his own plan. He was making his own kinds of decisions for his own good. To have good news and not share truly his sin. And to not receive it as deadly sin. I close with this. Some years ago, one of the area directors out in Southeast Asia had asked me to bring a small team of intercessors there to his part of the world, way up in the Himalayas, to a a people locked in darkness. And as we made those plans and God pulled those few choice intercessors together, the area director got back in touch with me and said, if it's not too late, I just cannot get this off my mind. And if you would, if there's any way you can redo the itinerary, I'd like you to also bring that prayer team through Bangkok, Thailand for a few days. I just sense it's critical. And so we were able to readjust the schedule and every one of those intercessors could get some more days. And so we took that team that was pointed toward the Himalayas. We also took them for some days of strategic intercession in that teeming mega city of Bangkok, Thailand. One day some of those missionaries there, Bob and Joy are some of the ones who were very very much right there serving at that time took us out to an area. They said, we've been trying for two years to plant a church out in this densely populated area. We absolutely cannot break through. We want to take the prayer team out. And we went house by house by house up and down those teeming streets. Spirit of Christ pleading for the pulling down of the strongholds and the going in of the Gospel. We ended by going by a little Baptist center. Last night on the way to supper, we passed the Baptist center here in New Orleans somewhere. I have no idea where it was. Is beautiful. Brick, landscape, yard. Forget that. This was a little poor storefront with a rusty steel garage door on the front. That's called a Baptist Center out there. Took two of us straining to get that creaky old sprung door up. 
But inside we heard the glory of the God who meets people. Every night they conduct English as a second language classes in that little Baptist center there in that Buddhist stronghold outside of Bangkok. They said there was one lady, kind of a uh, sort of a, oh, I don't know, late 20s, early 30s, professional-minded woman who was coming every night to the classes. She was trying to advance in her career. And she had a little girl, 10 years old, that she would bring every night with her. And the little girl would just sit over at the back on the side and she'd read her books or play with her toys or whatever while mom was going through her English class every night. Now, they use a wonderful textbook in that school there to teach English. And as they taught, they prayed for every single Thai who was there to learn. And they taught the truth. And the day gloriously came when that young mother received Jesus as her Savior. And how they rejoiced. But they said while they were rejoicing, then the little girl who always came and played and just did her own thing over there in the back, she said, I want to receive Jesus too. Well, they thought, well, she just wants to do what her mother wants to do. But you know what? As they began to talk with her, they realized she hadn't been playing away back there all these weeks and months. She had been tuned in and hearing every good word of the good news. And they led the little ten-year-old girl to Christ as well. Now, that mother and daughter came from a very wealthy family. The old grandfather, he was gone. He was dead. But the, the grandmother was the matriarch. And she was a scheming, wicked old woman. And when she found out that her daughter and her granddaughter had both become Christians, she was incensed. But she also knew that a direct approach was not the best approach. And so she began to try this and then try this. And as the weeks unfolded, nothing was working and she was becoming more and more frustrated. And finally she said to her daughter, and she was very wealthy, if you do not renounce this Christ and come back into Buddhism, I'm going to take you out of the will and you will not receive a cent. The mother had stood strong through every attempt by the old grandmother Until that. And at that point, she began to waver in silence. And beautifully, in that dangerous silence came that clear little voice from the girl. And she said, Grandma, if you want to keep all your money That's okay. We have Jesus now. And He's all we need. Jesus is saying to us, forget your big plans. Because big plans are just a synonym for little ambition. And if we're honest about it, they're not at all about following the Christ of the Scriptures, but instead following a Jesus who is a hand-fashioned Jesus into the image of our own desires. And instead, what He calls us to is simply to hearken back to the first words, the first day. We heard His voice. And they were simply these words. This is enough. You just follow Me. Would you bow just quietly now where you are? Anywhere, everywhere, I would follow on, follow, follow, I would follow Jesus, everywhere He fresh today by the Spirit's own speaking to us is the realization that Jesus is all 
we need. What we have to decide for ourselves is, is Jesus all I want? Or is there something else that's competing for a pure and undiluted loyalty to the Lord of Lords? Today He calls us to a new, to a fresh commitment to follow Him. And so I ask you, if that is the desire and the commitment of your heart, supremely, to follow Jesus wherever, whatever, would you just quietly stand right where you are, heads bowed. Jesus is the only audience. He's the one waiting and watching only. But behind Him, a world waits. Regardless of what any of us think, Jesus didn't call us to preach. He didn't call us to teach. He didn't call us to the ministry. He called us to Himself. Lord Jesus, before You, we've invited You now to have Your way. And You've done that gloriously. See our hearts. They would be pure before You. Hear now as we sing our testimony and our commitment to You. You sing now. Oh, oh, oh. 